Good. So welcome everybody to um, this week One World uh, IMP Mathematical Physics Seminar. Uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, John Imbri from the University of Virginia. And John will tell us about uh, on the many body localization transition. So John, we're very much looking forward to your talk. Well, yeah, well, th thanks very much for the invitation and opportunity to uh, present to everyone. And um, uh, yeah, I'm really excited about this this work, which um, uh, on the transition, which uh, um, uh, is um, uh, really um, solves some a little bit of mystery that, as, in terms of what the critical behavior is. I, had, I do have to mention, however, that it's um, there are many many approximations involved. So you know. It's in, in many respects more of a physics um, paper than a math paper, but um, um, but we do have uh, uh, nevertheless um, this is math union physics, so um, that's that's the way it is. Anyway, um, let me just um, um, talk a little bit about this. Is my abstract, which uh, went around to everyone. Um, the work uh, is um, with, um, there we go, um, Morningstar and Hughes a um, um, couple of years ago, uh, basically a series of approximations um, to develop a renormalization group flow for the many body localization transition. So I'm gonna start with some introduction to the many body localization world which um, uh, I'm going to apologize in advance because it's going to be, I'm going to try to flip through these slides pretty quickly to get into the actual transition work. Um, so I apologize. It's not really going to be a suitable introduction if you haven't uh, really been exposed to the MBL world, uh, but <laughs> there it is. Uh, so anyway, this is an outline for the talk. Uh, um, I'm going to basically review what MBL is and then talk a little bit about some of the insights from my partial proof of MBL from a few years back. And then I'm going to go to the uh, simplified picture um, uh, to kind of um, get rid of many of the degrees of freedom and just focus on the question of which are the intervals where it's localized, which are the intervals in one dimension where it's thermalized, and then use this picture to develop a uh, uh, theory of the transition out of the MBL phase. So, okay, so let me just quickly review uh, what the phenomenology of MBL is. Um, in many respects, it's similar to uh, localization, um, familiar Anderson localization situation, except it's basically in configuration space, where if you have maybe a spin system, the configuration is the set of um, spin configurations up down um, at each side in some lattice, in this case, a one dimensional lattice. You don't have uh, transport, you know, entanglement measures. Well, this is um, specific to the many body situation. You have area law entanglement. Um, uh, violation of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which is believed to be sort of go hand in hand with um, uh, thermalization with um, e uh, equilibration phenomena in the quantum setting. Um, absence of level repulsion, similar to what you would have in the one body situation, the Anderson localization situation, basically Poisson statistics. And um, logarithmic growth of entanglement for an initial product state. Um, so that's the that's the phenomenology. Um, typical example. This is the example that I was working with uh, in 2016, my paper on MBL, where you have a spin system, uh, up down spins, um, and some interaction term here. Um, but otherwise, it's a small perturbation of a diagonal matrix. These are Z spins here and here. So it's basically a small off-diagonal perturbation of a diagonal problem. Um, 
and uh, you have disorder, all right? So this, these, all these parameters here are, um, are random, typical ID type randomness. Um, and um, so, what, so when this happens and uh, you get into the MBL phase, what do you see? Well, you see, um, ultimately you see a complete set of conserved quantities uh, quasi-local in nature, meaning they're basically small perturbations, um, sort of spread out perturbations of the original uh, spin variables. Um, that is, if I go back to the original Hamiltonian, I said this term here is a small perturbation. If you take this away, then you have a diagonal matrix and the spin variables SZ um, are conserved quantities, obviously, they're diagonal. And once you introduce the perturbation, uh, then uh, you have to um, basically define to form versions of those spin variables, and those are called the local integrals of motion or lions. Uh, how do you construct them? Well, you you do so by creating a quasi-local unitary that diagonalizes the Hamiltonian. Um, quasi-locality means that the effect of the rotation on a set of spins that span a distance L is close to the identity matrix uh, and the, with an error which is exponentially small in L. And then there are rare regions where this property fails. So these are, we call them resonant regions or thermalized regions. And once you've got this uh, way of diagonalizing the Hamiltonian, um, then you can immediately construct these local integrals of motion by rotating the spin variables. Um, all right, so that's basically the program. Um, just to you know, to for uh, to get your head around this in a more concrete setting, let's think about this. Imagine we only had a single spin, so zero-dimensional problem. And then, <clears throat> if the octagonal pieces here are very small, then the eigenfunctions are close to the basis vectors, <clears throat> and the diagonalizing rotation is close to the identity. Um, and the other extreme, so that would be like localized. The other extreme, if you have um, the off diagonal pieces are large, then the rotation is large. And the eigenfunctions then are spread out, if so to speak, they're um, either one, one or one minus one or close to that. So we have a large rotation. That would be the thermalized situation of the analog if you have a single spin. So we're basically doing a many body version of this situation here. Um, now you can use perturbation theory to construct these local integrals of motion to construct these diagonaliz diagonalizing operators. Uh, but there's always going to be resonances, places where, at least in the single sites, you know, when this gamma might be large, uh, rare regions, let's say, where gamma is large. Uh, but of course, you have also more complicated. Uh, things involving spins separated by a distance. R, for example. Um, anyway, um, uh, I gave a non-perturbative proof of this construction in a one-dimensional spin chain, but I needed to assume an assumption on eigenvalue statistics, specifically that the level spacings um, in a system of n spins are no smaller than some exponential in n. Um, Anyway, um, actually, there are some people questioning the numerical evidence for MBL, so that um, means it's really important to have some mathematical um, way of uh, understanding that uh, the phase really exists. Um, so how does this proof work? It, basically, we control the probability for resonances and um, <clears throat> Ultimately, we're showing that the graph of resonances is non-percolating. Now, this is a two-dimensional picture. Um, if I were to think about the way the graph actually looks, you have maybe some resonant regions. They're very rare. Um, but then um, you have to, sometimes you have to connect them together because they, um, they're not far enough, apart, far enough apart to be treated as truly independent. So, Sometimes you have to connect these together. You end up getting a sort of a um, uh, 
uh, almost like a cantor set type situation where things connect at longer and longer length scales. So even though it's a one dimensional problem, uh, it still is um, um, a non-trivial percolation problem. We'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, as I indicated a moment ago, the, um, there's gonna be some rare regions where the, the bounds needed to control the, re the rotations are not good enough. So these are the resonances. Um, but every time you have a resonant region, you need to introduce this buffer zone here um, because this resonant region is gonna actually thermalize its um, immediate environment. Uh, the way this, um, you see this is that the um, smallest, smallness of, if you have a graph, typically you have some decay. Gamma is our small parameter here. You have decay, gamma to the L. Um, we needed this um, interaction decay uh, to become smaller than the level spacing in the resonant region. Actually, there's level spacing in this whole uh, region, including um, this whole region, including both the re original resonant region plus the buffer zone. So there's sort of this competition. You have to go far enough out in order that this uh, is beating that. Uh, this is uh, 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 kind of an introduction to the avalanche effect, which was uh, uh, basically introduced by de Roque and et al. Uh, the idea being that uh, if the decay rate of this interaction was not rapid enough that this uh, thermalizing of the neighborhoods would just go on forever. And that's gonna play an important role in our study of the transition. All right, so there's a kind of a renormalization group picture involved in this, in this uh, proof um, because, well, we, we organized the whole proof along a sequence of um, length scales, two to the L. And at each length scale, we um, remove terms in the Hamiltonian of order gamma to the L um, by means of these rotations um, to partially diagonalize the Hamiltonian. This is analogous to integrating out short distance degrees of freedom. Uh, at the same time, resident regions up to some size are, are eliminated using this um, is uh, provided they have this sufficient neighborhoods, they can be eliminated and you just define a big rotation to diagonalize this whole area here. Um, uh, so anyway, um, deep in the localized region, this RG is the property that the density of remaining resonant regions um, goes to zero with L. So we're basically getting sucked into the um, uh, localized phase with the, in this RG flow. So uh, there are two effects in play. Firstly, you eliminate the small resonant regions and that reduces their density. But there's an opposite effect going on where the resonant regions get fattened up because the buffer zones um, uh, get wider and wider. They scale up with L. And in the proof, basically I showed that this elimination uh, dominates the fattening up. Um, and so the density does go to zero as L goes to infinity. So that's in this uh, weak decoupling or strong disorder region. Um, now, if we move toward the transition, we have this uh, problem that I indicated earlier, this avalanche effect. Um, and so what's that all about? Um, uh, what happens is uh, the decay rate, um, which is this gamma to the L, um, can be reduced uh, to the point where the buffer size can no longer insulate the resonant region from the rest of the chain. So let's take a look at that, uh, what that sentence really means here. Uh, we have flip rates uh, for off-diagonal matrix elements. Let me just 
scroll up for a second here. And we're talking about these interactions here um, between the resonant region and this uh, the exterior world outside of the buffer zone. So you have some decay rate. Um, uh, uh, so you have some decay rate gamma to the L. The problem is that you have um, uh, you might have some other um, previously on previous scales you might have resonant regions in there. And the interaction does not decay across these regions. And consequently, this um, uh, the decay rate in this buffer zone tends to uh, flow um, downward. You get weaker and weaker decay. Um, so uh, let's introduce some terminology here. That I'm going to introduce this decay length zeta. Um, uh, so the, I want to say that the decay rate for off-diagonal matrix elements are going to um, uh, decay is two to the minus two L over zeta for some decay length zeta. This has to be small compared to the level spacing two to the minus R plus two L, which is the this is the combined volume for the resonant region plus its buffer zone. Uh, so clearly for this to work, we need zeta inverse to be bigger than one so that this um, L part um, can get dominated by this part here. Uh, so really you have what, uh, we have this deficit here, X is the excess decay rate. That's a very important, it's gonna end up being one of our important RG parameters. Uh, once you've determined what X is, you have a certain decay rate of these matrix elements, then the buffer size is gonna have to satisfy this inequality. So it's proportional to R, but the proportionality uh, involves one over X. So as X uh, tends to flow to zero, when you get toward the transition, as the decay rate gets weaker and weaker, you can see this buffer zone needs to get wider and wider. Um, so at some point, the decay rate, excess decay rate goes to zero, then the buffer size L will diverge and that's the transition. That's the, that's the theory of the avalanche effect, which was introduced by DeRoke and company um, some, some years ago. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna uh, transition to um, a much sim simplified picture. So that was, I was doing all that sort of in the context of um, my um, MBL paper where we really had spins and then we defined events involving um, uh, resonance, res resonances between energy levels in the spin picture. And we show those events were rare, but now we're gonna simplify the picture. We're gonna have an RG cutoff lambda, which is a length. Um, we have a one dimensional problem. So the line is gonna consist of alternating intervals, L blocks or localized blocks and thermalized intervals, T blocks or thermalized blocks. Um, so basically we have a kind of bimodality, which we're gonna assume is attractive where um, a region is going to either be completely thermalized or it's going to be completely localized. Um, and we're going to assume the decay rate deficit X is constant in space. Um, and actually this, uh, this approximation can be justified near the transition using Chase Harris arguments. We'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, so anyway, as I said, this, these L blocks represent intervals where quasi-local basis changes have been defined. And the T blocks are gonna have a minimum length lambda. That's what this space cutoff is. They represent intervals where the basis change cannot be defined because of too strong interaction with the, uh, with the neighborhoods. So these are the regions which and in fact, the RG time or the RG length scale lambda can be thought of it actually as re actual time uh, because 
And as real time proceeds, you get more and more thermalization happening. So you're basically going to thermalize up to some uh, length, which is um, uh, actually logarithmic in time. But anyway, time um, and lambda are connected in a very real sense, because as time goes on, the thermalization tends to spread to wider and wider regions. Um, okay, then there's the RG in here actually uh, is described in this last bullet point here. As we increment the length scale from lambda to lambda plus d lambda, the T blocks uh, in that length interval are erased. Remember the minimum um, uh, length, the minimum length is lambda for a T block. So as we flow the RG, the, we have to somehow, we have to do something with these T blocks that have minimum length. So there are two things that can happen. One is they can be erased if they have sufficient, um, if they're isolated, they're separated more by, than by a buffer size, lambda over X from the other T blocks. Remember I said earlier that the buffer zone has basically scales as one over X. So this is the, um, kind of the basic asymmetry between T blocks and L blocks in this uh, simplified RG picture that um, uh, T blocks have a tendency to group up with one another, very strong tendency to group up with one another because of this, especially as X tends to go to zero. But if they're well isolated, then they won't group up and they're gonna get erased. Um, now, the other thing that can happen is if a T block is not isolated, then it pairs with the neighboring T block. All right, so it's close. If it's not isolated, this has to be reasonably close to some other T block, which is um, lies within a distance lambda over X. And then they form a larger T block. And uh, so that what that means is the intervening L block is, um, is, uh, is erased, if you will, but um, and it's replaced with one large T block. So these blocks don't have the room to be to localize separately. Um, so that's basically the RG. Um, uh, the avalanche parameter X, this excess decay rate, then flows downward with the RG because, as I indicated earlier, the erased T blocks interrupt the decay of interaction. All right. So uh, basically, they're kind of like a short circuit. If you imagine, uh, you know, that you have very often in localization, you have a, um, a electrical model for a resistance model. Um, but if you have a resonant region, uh, that's basically like having a conductor. So the resistance uh, doesn't see that distance. Uh, it doesn't, um, so you don't get exponential decay across the resonant regions. All right, so uh, I basically described this in words. This can be incorporated in a very specific um, RG, a functional RG. Um, so let me describe this um, roughly uh, here. So we have um, the quenched randomness. We can assume that T blocks are appearing at random. Okay, so um, basically you have an exponential distribution in space for each subsequent T block. And of course we have a minimum distance uh, by construction, the minimum distance is lambda over X between T blocks. Um, so let's just say, okay, we have an exponential distribution. Let's let its rate be given by capital R, uh, which will depend of course on lambda. Um, so then that means the, uh, well, this is the, the exponential distribution, the probability that the length of the L block lies uh, in this DW sized interval um, between um, uh, lambda over X plus W and lambda over X plus W plus DW. So that's the exponential distribution. And we can further break down the rate according to the length little L of the T block that appears. Okay, so we have a, basically we imagine a continuous distribution of T block lengths. And so this overall rate can be broken down according to the length of the individual uh, T block that actually does appear. 
So then you have um, a functional renormalization group, which um, uh, basically um, comes, uh, this basically was described in a paper of Morningstar and Hughes, and we updated that uh, by, with this additional assumption that this um, uh, decay rate was constant in space. The original Morningstar Hughes FRG was, you know, just allowed that to um, go with the RG, whereas we're going to make sure it's constant in space to get something a little bit more uh, tractable. All right, so it's a complicated um, FRG, but um, let me just point out here that um, this, this, this first equation here describes the flow of X. So that's the flow downward of X uh, due to the presence of the thermalized blocks. And the second term, um, you'll notice here this quadratic piece here corresponds to the joining up of two T blocks. All right, so, um, so now we wanna somehow do something that, that FRG is itself a little bit too hard to analyze. Um, even if you accept that and wanna work from there, it's too difficult to analyze rigorously. So uh, what we did was basically uh, what, <laughs> What um, physicists always do is to come up with the key parameters and try to understand the flow in terms of those key parameters. So the, what are the key parameters of this problem? You have this rate, uh, and I'm gonna take the rate of occurrence of T blocks at the left endpoint. And remember, uh, this was, um, our lambda of L was the rate of occurrence for a T block of of size little l, but I'm doing it at the um, the left endpoint here, where where l is actually equal to the cutoff lambda. Now this uh, has dimensions one over length squared because we have to integrate both over little l and uh, and plus you have the exponential distribution, so that also means the rate has a length one over uh, dimensions one over length. So together is dimension one over length squared. So if we define a dimensionless rate y by putting in those factors of length, uh, then <clears throat> we have the two parameters here, y and x, which we hope will be uh, the key ones in describing the, <clears throat> the um, RG flow. And <clears throat> what we expect to see here is that uh, if we have a, um, Basically, we have parameter uh, plot here, x and y. And um, then um, basically this line here, x bigger than or equal to zero, um, y equals zero, x bigger than or equal to zero is gonna be a fixed line. Um, similar to what you might see in the, for example, in the KT transition. Um, so remember I said that as, um, uh, as X vanishes, uh, then the avalanche effect takes over. So over to the left here where X is negative, we expect to be driven off into the uh, low, um, thermalized phase. <clears throat> y here is basically some kind of measure of the density of uh, thermalized regions of T blocks. And we expect to see some kind of flow downward. Um, we expect to see some flow downward in this direction. But of course, if Y is too large, uh, then we, maybe we see flow upward. And in between, maybe uh, we might see a um, some kind of a separatrix where the flow is downward below and upward above. And basically that's the picture we're going to try to, um, to see in this problem. All right, so um, now what's interesting here, and this is a, a key observation, is that the, um, <clears throat> it seems reasonable, physically reasonable that the dominant mode of production of T blocks of size lambda over X should be the combination of component T blocks of size close to lambda. That's kind of the most efficient 
Uh, in other words, the least unlikely way to create a T block is to use the most likely component parts. And since the probability of these component parts decreases rapidly with their length, the most likely way to do this is to use, to use the smallest possible parts. Uh, so what does this mean specifically? It means you have very small blocks. Let's say if X is fairly small, then you have small T blocks are the ones that are gonna to combine together and form the next scale T blocks. This leads to a recursion relation where the rate um, is given basically by the square of the rate at the given um, length scale lambda over X is given by the uh, square of the rate um, on the previous scale lambda. And because of dimensional reasons, um, you know, you have this thing here, which is one over length squared. So you need, it works out properly that um, uh, we have a square of a length here, we have a square of a length there. Uh, basically these, the integrations involved here are because, um, although I said the most likely thing to happen was that this was of size lambda over L, you have to integrate over all possibilities and so you're actually going to integrate over the lengths here. We're going to integrate over the lengths here when you come up with all the ways of combining them to create this larger block. And that's why you need these two integrals uh, implicit in this capital R's here. Anyway, so this is a key um, um, recursion relation. Um, also, um, uh, uh, I want to translate this into the whys here, basically. Uh, so there's some other considerations that come into play here. We need some, this should depend weakly on lambda. Again, that's the same issue where um, you're always going to be using the least unlikely um, uh, situation. So these larger blocks are really not going to contribute too much um, uh, as far as the dependence on the cutoff is concerned when we consider how the makeup of blocks of size L. Um, for dimensional reasons, this um, rate here is gonna decrease um, like one over L squared and when, we, when we convert into this dimensional, uh, dimensionless parameter Y. Uh, so if we combine these facts, uh, we get a, <clears throat> a recursion relation between the Y at uh, lambda over X and the Y at lambda in terms of X. Um, so I don't know if it's worth going through this, but basically we have, we have these scale factors. Um, um, coming in from the scaling with one over L squared. But this is, the, this is actually just the definition of Y in terms of the rate, that's what I'm sorry. Um, and then we replace this with lambda because I said it was weakly dependent. And uh, then we can convert this um, using this relation into a formula involving capital R. And then we convert that back um, into Y's. And so we get a recursion relation that relates Y at lambda over X with Y at lambda. And as you might expect, you get this, um, you get this, it's a squaring relation, um, which as I indicated earlier, we have this FRG, which involves a squaring here, right? So it's, uh, and in fact, this squaring term, when we do this quantitatively, it does come out of this term on the right-hand side of the FRG. So th this basically, you can derive these, this recursion relation, which I'll reproduce here, almost sort of by pure reasoning based upon um, some general considerations. Uh, but you can actually confirm it quantitatively by analyzing the FRG. We do this in our paper. Uh, when, you, um, when you do that, you have the flow equation for X and um, flow equation for Y involving this. And as long as you have Y and Y over X are small, um, um, uh, you you can get this uh, recursion relation out of the FRG. And by the way, the first equation here, basically it's um, 
if I want to convert this into a flow for x, um, it looks like this, uh, lambda dx d lambda equals minus y. So we have now two uh, dimensionless parameters, y and x, and, um, um, and their flow equation, or in this case, we have a flow, and here we have a recursion. Um, so now it's important, uh, the next step is to understand what um, is the behavior of this RG flow. <clears throat> so, all right, so um, let me just, as a, to summarize here, I remind you, this basically is a, is a result of combinations of T blocks into bigger T blocks on, scale, on the next scale up. Uh, it tends to get accelerated when X is small. That's why you have this uh, Y over X. Uh, this is the flow downward of the decay rate by the presence of the T blocks, as I indicated earlier, these um, short circuits, if you will, on the resistance model. All right, now let's try to understand the flow here. Um, if we start on the curve Y, equals x to the two plus delta. And you plug this in here, we see that, okay, then we get x to the one plus delta. We square that, we get x to the two plus two delta. So we see uh, that this delta parameter, which kind of measures uh, the departure from the curve y equals x squared, um, basically doubles every time you do this recursion. So this is telling us that the separatrix is going to be asymptotic to the curve y equals x squared. Uh, the flow along the separatrix is then determined um, by because we have this equation here. Once we put y equals x squared, we get the x dt equals minus x squared. So that solves with t is x is t inverse and y is t to the minus two. I, I should have mentioned here. Um, I guess it was written, but I, we're using the um, logarithmic. T, t, RG time is basically logarithm of the distance cutoff, t, which is kind of the traditional um, parameterization for RG in physics. Anyway, um, uh, so the flow is actually determined on the separatrix. Um, below the separatrix, uh, what happens then is that X freezes and we, uh, this determines the scale jumps going forward uh, when forming thermal blocks. Um, remember, that you know, it was always a scale jump of size uh, one over X when you're combining blocks. That creates basically a kind of a Cantor set style um, of thermalized block with fractal dimension uh, log two over log X inverse. And we can see then then if we go toward the transition with X going to zero, um, that this fractal dimension also goes to zero. Um, and it, now we, there's an important check here that if you uh, stay near or below the separatrix, we do indeed have y over x small because separatrix is uh, x is y squared. So um, y over x is, um, so y is x squared. So uh, y over x is definitely gonna be small as long as y is small. So that validates the approximations used in deriving uh, these flow equations. Um, all right, now the next question that's of interest in the RG um, setting is uh, to understand the divergence, uh, the diverging length that occurs at the transition point. So you can define this as the point where the orbit uh, departs the vicinity of the separatrix from uh, an initial small displacement delta zero. And with a little bit of work, you can see that this length um, scales in a rather unusual way. Um, the delta zero to the log log delta zero inverse. And so in fact, what you see here is normally you'd have a divergent length, like, you know, the crit standard critical phenomena, you have delta to the minus nu. Um, uh, delta to the minus nu, uh, but you see here that effectively this nu is, itself is kind of flowing and it uh, goes to zero 
go, sorry, goes to infinity. Um, so this length scale is actually diverging faster than any power of delta. And so in effect, nu equals infinity. So um, there was a similar nu equals infinity phenomena in the KT flow, um, but uh, it's a very different type of divergence and the length scale uh, in KT length scale diverges like an exponential of an inverse power of delta. Um, and there are some important differences from the KT flow. I mean, topologically, it does kind of look similar to the KT flow uh, because um, where's the picture here? Um, this flow diagram you would see also in KT, um, but the shape of the septatrix and the actual rate of flow is very different. Um, Uh, so, um, like the KT flow, we have logarithmic slowdown along the separatrix and nu equals infinity. Um, but in KT, the progress is slow both along the separatrix and orthogonal to it. But we have exponential divergence away from the separatrix. Remember, we um, we had this business about the, if you're this far away from the separatrix, then you, the next step, you get to be this far away from the separatrix. So that's an exponential uh, divergence away. Um, we have exponential divergence along the slow progress along it, which leads to the unusual sensitivity in initial condition. Um, if one wants to see the system remain critical, at long lengths, <clears throat> at a long length scale, you have to be extremely precise in the initial condition. Uh, okay, so uh, let me just go back to, for a moment to this um, uh, earlier uh, point here. I decided to neglect the spatial fluctuations in X. Once we know that the flow involves nu equals infinity, then we can go to the chase at all inequality, which states that uh, nu is greater than or equal to two. Uh, so obviously we're way, way outside of that, uh, of that range. It's telling us that the fluctuations of size lambda minus one half in X. So these would be uh, the central limit theorem type fluctuations in the decay rate um, are, <laughs> because it basically the, the decay rate on some length scale L is going to involve a lot of um, independent events. Um, and so uh, the fluctuations in the average decay rate is going to decay um, as in central limit behavior. But this is going to be way smaller in comparison to the displacement actually that's required delta to the minus one over nu that's needed to depart the vicinity of the separatrix. So that, in that sense, these um, fluctuations are kind of irrelevant as far as determining the critical behavior of the problem. So here's a much nicer picture of the flow diagram. Um, of course, this, the actual separatrix here is a parabola or asymptotic to a parabola, but we are plotting square root of y versus x to kind of make this make it easier to, to follow. Uh, the sensitivity to initial conditions was is uh, comes into play. It's very hard to come up with uh, with initial conditions that follow the separatrix um, all the way down. So we actually have to construct this plot. We have to run it backwards. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, uh, you can actually define. Um, flow equation for y, which mimics the, this recursion relation that I gave to get a true flow uh, picture here. Um, and it's possible to show that if you use this equation for y, um, you get exactly the same behavior in terms of, uh, um, uh, for example, when you jump from jump of scale, um, um, Basically, this this is if you follow the flow of this, it's going to um, give you the same uh, behavior 
as as this one as this one here for y, we get the same jump from two to the plus delta, the two plus two delta off as you depart the, the separate tricks. So it's uh, in some respects, it's nice to have continuous flow equations for both x and y. Um, but an interesting point here to note is that um, when you translate this into a flow equation, we end up with logarithms. Um, so it's a non-analytic beta function, if you will. Um, these logs are very natural because uh, the fact that we're, the basic flow is determined by a squaring operation where you're, bas you're combining two of these rare events into an even rarer ra event at the next, next RG scale. Uh, this ended up with a squaring operation, but to do a squaring operation at an infinitesimal level, you're gonna have to take logarithms. And you can see here this, uh, Separate tricks pops out very naturally here because uh, when y is x squared, then log y over log x is equal to two. So um, the separate tricks comes out very naturally here in this picture as well. Um, I should I should point out that um, uh, there were some earlier works um, which postulated a KT picture for this transition, um, but they assumed as one normally does, that the flow equations would be analytic. And so then they um, didn't actually get the correct critical behavior. Um, or what we have is um, due to this non-analytic factor, log y over log x minus two, we actually in a different universality class from KT. So the picture in some respects looks similar to KT, but the actual, um, um, flow along these curves is different from KT. Um, and actually, there are a lot of parallels with the cost of the stylus transition um, in, at play here because, um, like the vortices in cost of the stylus, these T blocks represent non perturbative effects. And then the tendency of those effects to grow or shrink with the flow determines the phase uh, reached from any starting point in the diagram. Um, so in the KT, you have vortex binding. Uh, in our case, we have um, uh, basically when you have, when vortices, vortices bind in KT, then they're basically eliminated from the picture, but they renormalize the stiffness. Um, in our case, we um, erase the T blocks, but their presence is still felt because they renormalize the decay rate. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of like anti-screening, I guess you could, um, because they reduce the decay rate. Uh, anyway, um, I think that's uh, a good place for me to stop. So um, I very, again, I very much appreciate the opportunity to present this work and uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, John, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, I now leave the floor to the audience for questions or comments. Yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah, Hal, go ahead. Oh yeah, but probably Tom has. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. This is very interesting. But I, 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 to be honest, I still do not understand the connection between the original MBL problem and this particular RG equation that you considered. And of course, it must be a very difficult problem to really understand this. But. Uh, First, let me ask uh, this question. So the original problem is that of a, that with a quenched randomness, right? But this yeah. RG equation apparently does not contain anything random. So uh, where did randomness go? Is it only in the initial condition or? Well, um, you have these, um, uh, the randomness is present in the these exponential distributions for the um, for the locations of these T blocks. Which so it's basically, have, it's yeah. kind of like a percolation problem. You can think mm -hmm. about it that way. Mm -hmm. Of course, we if you have a percolate, percolation with continuous space, you have some rate of uh, appearance of um, objects. Mm -hmm. um, yes, but this exponential distribution is put into, you have this for the initial state. 
or me, me, the state uh, the 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 state where you start renormalization group and on uh, what I'm saying. So if you start from some some regular configuration, then you get totally different result from this recursion or well yeah let me just uh maybe try to do this by with pictures here let's start off with with just percolation all right mm -hmm. so with percolation we have um let's just the point percolation so we have just have some which is just a Poisson process okay <laughs> so we have the Poisson process um so obviously the this point process is a random initial state for the RG. Mm -hmm. So that's where the randomness comes in. Now, then we flow the RG. Well, um, let me draw a few more points here. Um, the, the ones that are close together get combined. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we go to a larger length scale, and then some others are erased. Um, so, uh, actually, I can use the eraser. Okay, these, this one was far away. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this one is far away. All right, so then we go back, we go to another length scale. These are close together, so they get combined. They get combined. Uh, and then maybe this one gets erased. Mm -hmm. And then we go again, we get to, and maybe then these are combined. So there's an underlying randomness, which then is inherited by all subsequent configurations. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly like what you have in the, in the model where you have a randomness, which is present at the microscopic level, uh, the individual points. There's some bonds which are resonant, some with bonds which are not. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't introduce new randomness as you go along. You just work with, with the configuration that you've, that you've got. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, other questions? May I ask a question? Yes, Jan. Uh, uh, what is what is the non mathematical evidence for MBL? Is it uh, is it experimental or is it numerical, or is it just uh, I mean? ideology or but yeah um that's a very good question because um uh the experimental evidence for a true mbl is is a little bit weak i mean uh um but both from real experiments and um and from numerical experiments uh the problem being that you have to you're kind of limited to small um, boxes uh, like for numerics, you typically are twenty or thirty sites, and um, so those boxes are really insufficient to see some of these complicated phenomena, which involving avalanches and so forth, which we believe are uh, important for the transition. Uh, exper uh, physical experiments are also difficult to do for large boxes because. It's almost it's kind of like a quantum computing problem where um, you need to, to isolate the system from the environment, but it's difficult to do that for a very large system. Um, but there have been experiments, um, in actually one in, in two dimensions as well, which uh, indicate lack of thermalization. But again, the length scales on which you don't see, which you can um, attain experimentally are are limited so um and some people actually question the numerics because uh um you know as you move uh as you, as you follow uh, like go from like say from l equals 12 to 16 to 18 to 20 22 you try to follow the <laughs> um uh and they they don't necessarily see things uh, tapering off and becoming localized over over the, those length scale ranges and um, and another thing is uh, <laughs> that the experiments typically are done with quasi periodic disorder rather than two disorder um, 
And there are good reasons to believe the quasi-periodic uh, uh, disorder leads to a different universality class, which is still um, being discussed theoretically. So anyway, there are lots of problems uh, with seeing these phenomena uh, 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 in experiments or numerics. And <clears throat> your uh, your uh, your analysis was uh, one dimensional, or does it apply to any dimension? It's yeah, uh, purely one dimensional. Yeah. But but do you or do people expect them beyond in higher dimensions? So I think the point of Wojciech and others was that you don't have MBL in two dimensions or higher. Yeah, um, the um, um, basically this it's it's borderline whether you have uh, as you can see it's it's kind of borderline mm. for the existence of MBL in one dimension, um, and when you go to higher, if you believe in this picture, uh, the the buffer zone, if you will, um, go back to the this picture. This buffer zone here, when you go into higher dimensions, um, it's going to be uh, a collar, this buffer zone here. And um, so the scaling of the um, uh, energy levels in the collar is going to be dimensionally going to be R to the D. And so, so then, as D is bigger than one, it's uh, you can't beat it with an exponential uh, in L. So, um, so we believe. Uh, I think it's generally believed that uh, in dimensions two or higher, you don't have a true MBL phase um, mm -hmm. in the context of um, uh, IID disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, situation might be different for, um, let's say, quasi periodic disorder. Uh -huh. Can I voice? Hello? Sure, please, yes? please, Michael, go ahead. Yes. Uh, hi, John. That's very hello. interesting. And hello. I, I, I love to see the normalization group uh, flow formulated. But I wanted to ask are you concerned about the dynamical effects, namely, even in the regime of localization, pure point spectrum, if the, if the Hamiltonian is time dependent, you do get diffusion. Now, in the system that you are discussing, in, in a many body system, I do not know how much confidence can we have about the absence of sort of dynamical effects. After all, uh, it's, a, it's a large system, many, many, you know, many particle system, uh, this purely static picture of localization versus uh, transmission regimes may be subject to some jiggle. And then this uh, other phenomenon, which I mentioned, that if you have time dependent operator, then the spectral information is uh, actually no, no longer that relevant. Is this a concern? Um. Well, I'm I'm a little bit uh, I'm not exactly sure what type of time dependence you're talking about. I mean, uh, even if we go, let's say, for example, to the Anderson type binding model, single body problem. Um, if you were to introduce some time dependence there, then then you would spoil the localization, I guess, as you were saying. But nevertheless, it's still um, worthwhile considering the time independent problem, um, even if it's in some sense, it's an idealization. Right. Um, or are you saying somehow the time dependent effects are much stronger in the many body context? Or, I, I, I would I, I would wor worry about that, yes. In other words, it may lo localization in the strong sense which you described means localization forever. And uh, when you are sitting within a large many body, large system with you know many particles, uh, 
uh, that's a very strong statement. Uh, even if, I mean, there may be there may be some time time scales on which uh, it would seem localized, but in the long run, since everything after all jiggles, uh, I would want I would wonder whether uh, this sort of simple picture would be valid forever. Yeah, I mean, again, I would just to say that it's, a, it's an ideal, which um, of course is never realized perfectly in practice. Um, and I guess in, and yeah, in the NBA, in the many bodies situation, it's maybe more imperfect than most, but, uh, um, but you know, you could say the same thing about virtually any system. You take the Izzy model um, and, uh, you know, any physical system that actually represents the IC model is actually subject to quantum effects and um, and we're ignoring those and, you know, um, but we still study the IC model, right? <laughs> right. Uh, and it, admittedly, it's very difficult. It's, uh, I mean, I alluded to this earlier. Uh, you need to isolate your system uh, from the environment to see these effects. And yeah, it's very difficult to, you know, get anything macroscopic that's isolated. Uh, so in that sense, uh, we're, we haven't, you know, learned how to get into the macroscopic regime. We're, you know, we're, we're at the reg experimentally, maybe we're at the level of hundreds of spins or something like that. And, um, uh, but yeah, all I can say is, uh, so in some sense, you could say it's a theory of nothing, but uh, because it will never achieve it. But, uh, but as a theoretician, I think it's uh, uh, always worthwhile to understand um, the appropriate limits of the systems under study. Yeah, that's true. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there questions or comments? So it does not seem to be the case. So uh, let's thank again, John, for the very interesting talk. Okay, thank you very much.